Okay, if you can just, um, just give me your name, actually. And... My name is Louise Fiewuz. Mm -hmm. and, and where are we now? We're in uh, Paratapa Sheikh on the Turkmen Steps in the north eastern part of Iran, right near the border with Turkmenistan. And this is really the, the heart of horse country. For Iran, it is, yes, the heart of horse country. I think the horse uh, has always been used here and bred here, and some of, well, probably Iran's finest horses come from here. Mm -hmm. پدر من وکیل بر ایران بود بعد از جنگ جهانی دوم موقعی که روسا نرفتن بیرون از آذربایجان پس ما خیلی آشنا شدیم به حسین علا آمدم فریدون رو ببینم فامیل حسین علا ببینم بعد اون موقع آشنا شدم به نرسی فیروز که رفت شیراز اینو دیدم و منم خیلی علاقمند به تمام این منطقه شدم وقتی که آمدم اینجا فهمیدم که ایران چه اسب خوبی داره آمدم اینجا دیدم که واقعا اسب ایران عجیب قریب دیگه I did move up here 20 years ago for a variety of different reasons but and set up this stud farm with my husband, late husband but first we raised mainly Caspian ponies and then um, we started raising these pure red turquoise it's a horse culture area, certainly historically. Do you ever look out over the mountain and think, well, it's time to go, time to get on the horse and... Uh... Oh, the thought has occurred to me, actually, on a couple of different occasions. And then every time it does, and I look around the world, I've decided that I'm in the best place anyway. And it's a great place for doing riding expeditions. Oh, it would be fantastic. That, that, that's right. It's the horses that have really always captured my imagination in Iran, although Iran itself is such a fantastically beautiful country. It's, I was actually looking for some ponies for my children when I ran across um, these little horses up on the Caspian Sea. And uh, we, my husband and I bought a couple of them and um, the children started to ride them and then we started to wonder, well, where did they come from? It was what would originally get me really interested in the history and the, the whole area of Iran, the Middle East, was the horses. And it was the research into the horses that then pulled me up with the ancient civilizations, the, the Scythians, the Achaemenians, the Parthians, because they, they dealt with exactly the same horses that we're dealing with today. In fact, in, during the time of the Parthians, I'm told that the main race horses in Sparta came from this area. And for sure, Alexander uh, may have killed off the people, but he certainly took their horses, and uh, I'm sure Chinese Khan did the same. So the horses went east to China and up to Mongolia and west into to Europe. Europe. Right. Mm. right. There's even a suggestion that Bucephalus, Alexander's horse, was perhaps from here, or certainly descended from a uh, Turkoman horse. Oh, it's, it's possible. Uh, they had such a good reputation that I imagine that Alexander would only have been satisfied with the best. The Oriental horse was uh, developed, uh, well, the, the, what you know as the Oriental horse really is probably the Arab and the types of horses that you find in the Arab countries. That was developed as a result of a crossing of the native uh, pony of the Zagros, now we call it the Caspian, and the Turkoman horse, which is um, a breed that embraces the Yamut and the Guklan and the Akhal Teke uh, together. And there's been a lot of work done um, with chromosome uh, typing, with, with DNA typing. There has, by Dr. Gus Cotton at the University of Kentucky. We've sent him blood from all of the various different breeds of horses in Iran, and he's compared them with blood he's taken from Europe and the United States. And his conclusion is that um, the same conclusion we reached working on bones from archaeological sites, that um, the most ancient forms of uh, the Oriental horse are the Turkoman and the Caspian pony. So it's quite uh, contentious what you're saying because for 
for centuries people said the Arab is a breed. Some people suggested the Arab was a species completely separate from other horses. Mm-hmm. And this is wrong. That's wrong, no. It, it's a, uh, it's an equus cavalus that has 64 chromosomes. The problem is that I frankly don't think there ever was anything called the Arab. I think it was a group of, uh, of strains because it's an awfully large geographical area to have all the same breed. So it was the Koilan and the Hamdani and the Zeglavi. I don't know all the various different types. But the, the Arab has been developed by Westerners who took them abroad and bred them without reference to their individual strains the way the Arabs bred them. And so they called it the Arab. I don't think the Arabs call it the Arab. And in fact, the Iran is not called the Arab either. It's called the Asil, which means purebred. We, we actually, we know exactly what this horse is now. But as I said, it, it, it took 40 years um, of study to identify these original types of oriental horse. So she's a fossil, really. She's a, well, yes, and uh, in fact... you rediscovered? Uh, yes. Well, I was going to say, have you come head-to-head fist-fighting with the uh, Arab Horse Society and Arab enthusiasts in, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, for instance? Yes. Yeah. No. No, no, I haven't. Uh, I stay far away from politics of that sort. Uh, that's up to them. They, they can either accept this whole thing or not accept it, and if it doesn't suit them to not accept it, it's fine. But it's fact. And it's been borne out by archaeology, by um, biology, right? By oral history, it's and pretty much irrefutable. The genetics, it is irrefutable. I'm still finding out what it is, and I'm not so sure whether I'm saving anything or not. I think what I'm doing is having a good time, but in the meantime, also corresponding with a number of people abroad, like with people uh, like Bonnie Hendricks and Gus Cawthon, and slowly, slowly, we've put together a picture of. Uh, what the horse was, what his genetic makeup is, and how the whole picture fits into the oriental horse. So in fact, we have uh, solved the mystery of um, uh, whence the Arab. Well, in their own environment, they're capable of traveling great distances over a very uh, harsh country with no water because they have a very meatless body and they're kept that way, sweated down with these felt blankets. Uh, broad and particularly with the Russians they've been uh, capable of incredible feats of jumping and also dressage so I, I suppose uh, taken to the West they, they could be used for any one of the sports whether it's endurance riding or uh, dressage or jumping what, what are the defining countries what would you see in a typical horseman here and horse in the way of trappings and saddlery and so on and so forth well first of all you probably wouldn't even see the horse because he's covered with a felt and second, ridden by a man, very seldom by women. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a woman on a horse here, although I'm sure they did in the old days. And the men wear sheep, uh, skin, hats, um, caracol, I guess it's called, isn't it? The, uh, the bridles are always snaffles, and the saddle is a small, high-candled, high-pommeled uh, saddle that's made by themselves. And what do you hope for the breed? in the coming years, in the, in the next 10, 20 years? Well, I don't, first of all, I don't think I'm going to be around for another 10, 20 years, but I hope that um, they will become popular again in Iran so that there's a good market for them, so that more Turkmans will keep them. And personally, you know, this is a very satisfying thing to have done. Everybody always thinks, you know, their lives that, oh, wow, well, I'd like to do something, make a little mark. I don't want to just be a passenger on this world. I want to have contributed something in my life. and. Uh, this is my contribution, this horse. Apparently it's uh, quoted in the Quran that if you, every grain of barley you feed to a horse is a step closer to heaven. Well, you should be very close at this point. I know, it's wonderful, about to slip in. Yeah. <laughs>